What's the price of a bond? Most sources would define it as the present value of the cash flows. That is the contractual cash flows, the coupon and principal payments scheduled over the bond's life. But is that the truth? Well, unfortunately, given the way most people in the bond market would interpret price, that is not true, at least for most bonds most of the time. Hi, I'm Doug Carroll for InsidersGuideToFinance.com with another video dealing with bond market jargon and trying to unpack some of the issues that are oftentimes confusing, especially for newcomers to the market, but even people who've been around the business for a while that don't have to deal with this on an ongoing basis oftentimes find confusing. Unfortunately for clarity of understanding, most bonds don't have a single price. Now I'm not talking about the distinction between price and fair value as was discussed in another video, nor am I talking about the difference between a bid and ask price. Just looking at one side of a dealer's quote, there are multiple prices implied for most bonds most of the time. When market participants hear price, they normally interpret that as flat price or clean price, market price. All those phrases are interchangeable. And yet bond trades settle at their full value. Thus for any coupon bond, in addition to the price the buyer and seller have negotiated, or the bid or the ask at which the investor has traded a bond with a dealer, the normal convention in the bond market is to calculate the dollar amount of accrued interest on the next due coupon, that is the interest that's been earned starting on the last coupon payment date and running up until the settlement date of the trade, the date beneficial ownership of the bond changes hands, that accrued interest will automatically be added on to whatever price the buyer and seller have agreed to. Consequently, most bonds are quoted flat but trade with interest. That's the industry jargon or shorthand for bonds will be quoted at their market or flat or clean price. But unless special circumstances apply, both the buyer and seller will assume that the accrued interest, just described a few moments ago, will automatically be added on to the price that the buyer and seller have agreed to. So that means we'll be required to make a distinction between the quoted price, flat price or clean price, and a bond trade settlement value, oftentimes referred to as the dirty price, and at least for coupon bonds not in default, those numbers will be different. So the statement I started the video off with, that a bond's price is the present value of the future cash flows, if by that we mean the dollar amount the buyer and seller are going to exchange, that statement would be only true twice a year for semi-annual pay coupon bonds, which are the norm in the majority of sectors of the U.S. fixed income markets. Because a trade settling on any day other than a coupon payment date means that in addition to the price agreed between the buyer and seller, that accrued interest is going to be added on to determine the settlement value of the transaction. Now, that word salad might be relatively confusing, if, especially if one is trying to picture all that in their mind's eye. It's likely going to be easier to follow if we work through a specific example. So let's price a particular semi-annual pay coupon bond twice. Once for settlement on a coupon payment date, the other time for settlement between coupon payment dates. The bond we'll use will be a $1,000 par value, 5% coupon, semi-annual pay bond, trading at a 6% yield to maturity. On the upper right hand side of the video, you'll see the generic price yield formula, saying the price is equal to the present value of the future cash flows. And below that, the formula is fleshed out with the numbers for the bond just identified. So 5% on $1,000 par, well that's of course $50 a year, but since the coupons are semi-annual, each of the periodic coupons is $25. And since we're assuming this is a term security, that means the final or sixth cash flow is $1,025, because naturally the par value is paid in full at maturity on a term bond, along with the last of the semi-annual coupons. The divisors in the formula are now 1.03, 0.03 being the 6% annual yield to maturity divided by 2 and then rendered in its decimal equivalent. 
and each of the 1.03 divisors are raised to a power that reflects the time until the receipt of the cash flow being discounted. Now since this first example assumes it's a bond that will have exactly three years to maturity from the settlement date, that means the first $25 coupon payment is divided by 1.03 to the 1 because that semi-annual coupon is due in exactly one coupon period six months in the future. The second $25 coupon is divided by 1.03 to the second power because the second due coupon is due in exactly two coupon periods. And so forth and so on all the way out until the final cash flow, the $1,025 due in three years, and that's divided by 1.03 to the sixth because naturally in three years there are six semi-annual periods. Since this bond has exactly three years to maturity, that means the present value of the cash flows will be the price. So what happens if we perform the operations, that is, find the present value of each of the individual cash flows and then sum them? We'll have the bond's price. So if you take the first $25 coupon and discount by 1.03, that gives the present value of $24.27. Yes, the coupon is $25, but it's $25 six months in the future. Discounted back to the present value is where the $24.27 comes from. The second $25 coupon is discounted by 1.03 squared. That gives us a present value of $23.56. And so forth and so on, all the way out to the final cash flow, the $1,025 due at maturity, divided by 1.03 to the six. That gives a present value of $858.42. So by summing the present value of the individual cash flows, we get a market price of $972.91. So that dollar amount is the present value of the future cash flows and is the market price of that bond. But now let's consider an alternate scenario using the same security. Let's say we have the same three-year bond, but it's two months forward in time. So in other words, what in that last example was a three-year bond, that is a bond with three years to maturity, after two months, that same bond, of course, would have two years and 10 months remaining to its maturity. But let's say that bond is again, or perhaps still, trading a 6% yield to maturity. What would be its price? Well, again, we need to insert the appropriate amounts, that is the cash flows and the yield to maturity expressed as a periodic rate on the right-hand side of the equation. And again, bond pricing will require we find the present value of the future cash flows, but now that we're in a different situation, the number that results from that computation will have a somewhat different interpretation. Now you'll note in this example, with the bond having only two years and 10 months remaining to maturity, while the contractual cash flows and the discount rates are all exactly the same, there is one significant difference. Note the exponents for the divisors. Each of the denominators is now raised to a different value. Because you'll note if the bond has two years and 10 months to maturity, versus the original example where there was six months until the first coupon was due, now only four months remain until the first coupon is due. And since there are six months in a coupon period and only four months remaining until that coupon is due, there's only four-sixths or two-thirds of a coupon period until the first coupon is due to the bondholder. Now for regular bonds, since each coupon payment date is one full coupon period after the previous one, now the second due coupon is due in one and two-thirds coupon periods. The third due coupon in two and two-thirds coupon periods. And so forth and so on. That fraction of a period that remained until the first coupon was due is carried forward to all the subsequent cash flows. The nth or final coupon in principal amount is now due in five and two-thirds coupon periods, which is just a complicated way of saying two years and ten months. My strong suspicion is that some of the viewers of this video think I'm needlessly complicating the issue by talking about the divisors being raised to fractional powers. Well, guess what? I haven't even reflected in this example the full complication of the issue because those exponents would actually be rendered in terms of the appropriate day count convention, 3360, actual days, whatever the case may be. 
but that may be a subject for another video. In this case, I'm going for the clean price, dirty price distinction, so let's motor on with this example. How do we get the price of the bond now that it's got two years and 10 months to maturity? Well, the process is generally the same, although as we'll see when we get near the end, there's one additional twist that has to be factored in. But the next step is finding the present value of each of the individual cash flows. So now we're discounting the first $25 coupon by 1.03 raised to the two-thirds power, which gives us a present value of $24.51. The second coupon of $25 is discounted by 1.03 to the one and two-thirds power, or a present value of $23.80, and so forth and so on, all the way till the final cash flow, the 1025 due at maturity, discounted by 1.03 raised to the 5 and 2 thirds power, which gives us a present value of $866.92. So again, by summing the present value of the cash flows, we get a present value of the cash flows of $982.55. But is that $982.55 subject to the same interpretation as the $972.91 that we got as the present value of the cash flows when it was a three-year bond. In other words, is that 982.55 the price? Well, not as most people in the fixed income markets would interpret the word price because as referenced earlier, price when used by itself is normally understood to mean flat price or clean price or market price. That is the price without any adjustment for accrued interest. And also, as indicated earlier, when a bond trade settles between coupon payment dates, the present value of all the cash flows includes the accrued interest, the portion of the next due coupon that's been earned from the last coupon payment date up until the settlement date of the trade. So if you have a bond quoted on a yield basis, as by implication this bond was, for trade settlement between coupon payment dates, you can't find the market price through the process we've just walked through. Through a completely separate methodology, we'd have to calculate the accrued interest. And once having calculated the accrued interest, subtract it from the present value of all the cash flows, and whatever the result would be, would be the market price. So is the present value of the future cash flows ever synonymous with market price? So naturally, where accrued interest doesn't intrude, the answer is yes. So zero coupon bonds. Since there is no coupon to accrue, the present value of the cash flows is the price. Or for coupon bonds in default, the convention for such securities is that they're quoted flat and trade flat. If the issuer hasn't been paying coupons recently, it would be inappropriate to price trade settlement based on some assumption about accrual of the next coupon. But for coupon bonds, only when trades settle on the coupon payment date is the present value of all the cash flows synonymous with price. But for coupon bond trades settling any day between coupon payment dates, then the present value of all the cash flows includes the accrued interest. In other words, for coupon bonds trading for settlement between coupon payment dates, the present value of the cash flows is the dirty price. And the only way to get the clean price after we found the present value of all the cash flows, as we just did for that bond when it had two years and 10 months to maturity, is go through the industry standard conventions for calculating the accrued interest, backing that out of the present value of all the cash flows, and then the residual is the market price, which is generally what the word price is taken to mean, at least in the vast majority of instances. I hope you enjoyed this video. You can go to our YouTube channel or Facebook page to see other videos on a range of investment-related topics. Or you can go to the website, insidersguidetofinance.com. At our website, in addition to the free video shorts, there are a series of modestly priced, in-depth training videos with running times of approximately one hour each that go into a number of subjects in greater detail. The website and Facebook page also contain information about open enrollment programs I will be presenting over the next few months and my recently released book, The Insider's Guide to Fixed Income Securities and Markets.